Listen, I got to tell you, I, I, I mean, I always say nice things about my guest books because I, I wouldn't have them on if I didn't enjoy the book because that's how I started the podcast in the first place was these are books I would read anyway and then I have the opportunity to actually talk to the author, which is fun. But your book is really one of the most important I've read in a long time. Uh, wow, that's incredibly nice of you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, and not just because it's well-written and research and all that stuff, because the topic, you know, it's it's like we've spent our whole lives as social scientists trying to find meaningful patterns in random noise. And we think we have it down, you know, where we can make some probabilistic predictions based on large scale forces and laws and whatnot. But, you know, what you really show is that chaos, contingency, randomness, chance, whatever words you want to use, plays a much bigger role than any of us think. Is that the purpose of your book? Are you writing, you know, this is my favorite quote from Darwin, you know, all observations must be for or against some view if they are to be of any service when he was accused of being too theoretical in the origin of species. <laughs> so I gather you're, you're pushing back against these, these deeper social science uh, uh, program. Yeah, you know, I think there's a few things that sort of are the origin story of the book. I mean, one of them is personal. Um, I, I tell the story early on in the book of how I'm basically the byproduct of a mass murder <laughs> and how I wouldn't exist but for a, a mass killing that happened in 1905, which was uh, unfortunately done to done by one of my uh, not ancestors but the relative of my of my great grandfather who um who th thankfully remarried and uh led to me but the the bigger sort of ideas aspect of the book there's sort of two strands that I come at this with one is I've been a disillusioned social scientist for a pretty long time where I I just don't think that what we're doing is that useful a lot of the time and I also think it's this sort of fake version of reality that doesn't really exist when we set up these models that are pretty much always wrong and only sometimes useful. Um, and then I also think there's this aspect of sort of malaise in the general population about how we see ourselves in the world. And I think these ideas are actually quite linked. Um, I think that the, the, the model version of reality in which everything is neat and tidy and there's all this sort of X causing Y and all this type of stuff doesn't align with the messiness of the real world. And that causes us to misunderstand who we are and the purposes of our lives. And so the book is part science, part social science, part chaos theory, and part philosophy. Um, and, and I'm trying to bring those strands together to, to say something a bit different. Right. So your specialty is dealing with uh, power corruptors like dictators and autocrats and so on. And in your previous book, you, you really looked for and found patterns. Why, you know, why these people get and hold power and so on and how do that works. But now you're saying that that would only apply what maybe probabilistically to a large uh, data set of autocrats. But if you want to know when is Putin going to be toppled or when's he going to finish the inv invade Ukraine, you know, say two years ago, trying to predict that you're saying that can't be done no, no matter how good your social science models are. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that there are useful, there's usefulness to trying to tease out patterns. But I think often we focus so much on this sort of what I call the holy grail of causality, where you're trying to find the perfect pattern, the X that causes Y, which is not really how the world works, that you end up losing sight of how the world actually does function. And the example I'd give you is that I, in my PhD, I studied coups, right? The, the sort of overthrow of, uh, of authoritarian leaders. And yes, there, there are correlations that we can draw to define patterns, but most people would actually guess what they are. They're places that are poor, there are places that have a poor history of civil military relations where coups have happened in the past, where dictators are fragile, etc. And if you make a list of those countries, you're basically pretty good. You're 90% you're of the way there to a lot of the social science models that predicts coups. When I actually studied coups, what I found were the irregularities and the randomness. So one story I tell in the opening chapter of Fluke is this idea about this, this coup plot in Zambia, where basically, you know, I interviewed a soldier who, who was involved in it. And the plot pivoted on a split second. You know, he grabbed the uh, the pant leg, the trouser leg of a general uh, trying to climb over a wall. And if he had grabbed him and, and held on, he probably would have succeeded in overthrowing the government. But he was a split second too late. And so the government survived because the general escaped. And, you know, I think this is the kind of stuff where anytime historians look at why things happen, they see contingencies. They see the sort of randomness. They see the alternative pathway. And I think when social scientists try to look at the world they're trying to tease out the, the sort of big picture, which creates this really alluring illusion, not only that the world is neat and tidy, but also that we can control it. Because when you have a model that shows X causing Y, then all you need to do is tweak the X and then you get a different Y. And I, I just don't believe that that's how the world actually works. I think it's much more complex 
And I think small contingent changes, accidental changes have a much bigger role than we're told by those sorts of people who reflect society back at us in social science. Right. In reading that chapter of your book, I was thinking about the fall of the Soviet Union, triggered before that by the fall of the Berlin Wall itself. Um, totally unpredictable. I mean, it came down to that one soldier, that one guard who didn't didn't have the right uh, a command of whether he should I forget, open the gate or close the gate or whatever it was. And then he just opened it instead of closed it. And then that led to people pouring through and that led to people demolishing the wall and no one stopped him. And but it, so that's unpredictable. Would it be correct to say that one reason no one predicted it, or pretty much no one, is that they themselves didn't know it was going to happen? It's not like if you were inside Russia or inside East Berlin, you would have seen it coming. Nobody saw it coming because they didn't even know themselves. Yeah. So I think this is the nature of how reality works, where, you know, what we try to do is we basically try to infer backwards after something happened exactly why it happened. And so we look for big causes for big events, right? And, and, and I know lots of your work, you've talked about things like conspiracy theories, right? So there's magnitude bias and this sort of thinking where it's like, you know, oh, there's a big event, it must have a big cause. I think the problem with that is there's so many unforeseen things, whether it's the soldier at the Berlin Wall or, you know, near misses with nuclear weapons and so on. You have all these things where people didn't even know that they were happening at the time, right? They didn't realize that these things were important. And so, you know, whenever we trace history backwards, we have a set of discrete variables that we're already looking for. But very often, those variables are not the most important triggers, right? So my point of view is that they have this sort of hidden world of forking paths that are constantly diverting our trajectories that often we're completely unaware of, right? So the, the example that's sometimes used in, in some philosophy, political philosophy uh, ideas I've read is about this idea that, you know, you're a motorcyclist or a, a cyclist careening down the road. And all of a sudden, you know, you get walloped in the eye with a fly and it causes you to crash your bike, right? And you, and you die. Now, you had no idea that the trajectory of that fly was important until it killed you, but it, it was, right? And I think that's the kind of stuff that's written out of models where these little details that we would never imagine sway history are actually doing that all the time. And that's not just true for history. It's also true for our own lives. I guess the problem is there's no way to model contingency other than, other than to say crazy shit happens once in a while and we can't build that into the model. So by definition, a social scientist has to look for these larger necessitating laws and forces or else what are you doing? Well, that, that's where I guess we, we might slightly disagree on this, right? Because I think that there is something that's actually useful about being truthful about the way the world works, even if you can't model it. And I think, mm. I think a lot of hubris comes out, damaging hubris comes out of social science models in economics, political science, et cetera, because we pretend we can actually model the world, right? Mm. And, and I think it's actually more useful to say, look, there's some things that we just don't know, and that's fine. Like, I don't understand, for example, why we need to forecast what GDP growth will be in Burundi in 2030. We don't know. We have no idea, right? I mean, all the forecasts about geopolitics were invalidated by the 9-11. All of them were invalidated by the financial crisis, then by Trump's election, then by the pandemic. I mean, it's, it's just a series of being wrong year after year after year, and we don't change anything. And my point of view is that it's time for us to say there are limits, right? The world is so complex and there's so many random contingencies that, sw that sway trajectories and divert society and our own lives so much that... Yes, we can tease out patterns, but let's admit when there is just radical uncertainty that we can't tame because then we make smarter decisions, right? I mean, the hubris that comes with a modelable world is that we can tame the world, and I don't think we can. So, you know, my, my point of view on this is more akin to a lot of people who work in complex systems theory and also in science, which is that they just understand the limits of their knowledge. And I think social science too often has hubris um, suggesting that we can, we can tame this world that we can't. Yeah, now we, we don't have much daylight between us there. I agree with that. Um, given the fact that we still want to try to make predictions, uh, I, I liked your discussion on economic forecasting. Uh, you didn't use this line, but I've heard it before. You know, Economists predicted 10 of the last five recessions. <laughs> you, know, you make enough predictions, they get some right. Yeah, uh, And I guess the problem is, is that there's just so much chaos and randomness in it. All right, let's, let's go back for a second. What do you mean by, what's the difference contingency chaos, randomness, probability, you know, just kind of tease apart those terms. Sure. So contingency is what I would title the book if that word was not mm. <laughs> completely impossible to sell, right? It's right. really what the book's about. And it's where the world pivots or could be different. It forks 
uh, at a moment, right? So like my favorite example of contingency, just absolute astonishing contingency, uh, is this moment two billion years ago where a mitochondria found itself uh, birthed basically because one microbe went inside of another, right? Mm. And as far as science can tell, this happened once in the span of all Earth's history, and it's the origin story of complex life. So literally everything that exists that's beyond you know, a single-celled organism basically uh, was derived from this, this historic accident two billion years ago. That is contingency in a huge way because maybe it would have never happened again, right? There may have never been complex life instead. Or the dinosaurs, you know, getting extinct from the asteroid. If that hadn't happened, mammals wouldn't have risen, we wouldn't exist, right? So the contingency that you then think about on human scales is sometimes more well-known. Things like, for example, um, you know, the assassination of, um, you know, b before World War I, um, or you also have in the, in the opening chapter of the book, the first story I, I start fluke with is the contingency that happens where uh, a couple goes on vacation to Kyoto, Japan in 1926, falls in love with it. And lo and behold, the couple, the husband, uh, ends up being America's secretary of war during World War II and twice intervenes directly with President Truman to get Kyoto taken off the top slot on the targeting list for the atomic bomb and ends up sparing the city purely because 19 years earlier, his wife liked Kyoto, basically, right? And so you have 100,000 people live and die in two different cities simply because one couple took a vacation there 19 years earlier. So that's contingency. Um, chaos is a, a scientific term that I'm using loosely in a social sense because chaos theory has specific definitions. It's basically a deterministic theory in science which says that uh, a complex system has sensitivity to initial conditions, which basically means that tiny perturbations, tiny changes can have enormous effects as the system evolves. And the way that we all understand this really, really well and the origin story of chaos theory is the weather, which is precisely why we can't predict the weather beyond you know, seven to 10 days with any sense of accuracy because it's simply so sensitive to these tiny fluctuations that if we're even off by a tiny bit, the world unfolds radically differently. I, I apply this as an analogy or a useful frame to understand social worlds because I think that our lives are subject to this all the time, right? Where you have sort of aspects of chaos theory that sometimes we can trace back, but very often we don't know why things have happened because we're part of this world of 8 billion people constantly making decisions with timing and movement and all these other things. Uh, and so I think that chaos theory is actually a very, very important but neglected way of, of understanding our world. I've now droned on quite a long time for just two definitions. So maybe you oh, no, can interject. All, no, that, that's all good. Let's, let's use the... That first one on on um, contingency and life, and contrast Steve Gould's emphasis of contingency and the randomness of the evolution of life. You know, and your your example is a good one. And there's lots of of, of branching forks, or what is it? The Garden of Branching Forks was that is that the analogy? The, gar the Garden of Forking Paths. The Forking Forks. Right? Paths. Yeah. There's you know a gazillion of those in the history of life. Although, and I liked, you know, Steve Gold was a friend. I, I really liked his contingency stuff. I wrote a lot about that back in the 90s. But then I read Simon Conway Morris's book, Life Solutions. And then since you, in your book, you contrast contingency with convergence. So more, Simon Conway Morris's whole thing is convergent evolution. That although there might be these little contingent events that make the wing look this way or that way, if you're on a planet with this kind of gravity and you have water, land, and air, you're going to end up with organisms that have something like wings to uh, master uh, flight, legs and arms to maneuver around on the land, and something like a fusiform body to push through the water with some kind of fins. So the, the, how they turn out specifically is going to be kind of contingent, but you're inevitably going to get something that is similar on some other planet. This is his argument for like convergent evolution on other planets. It depends on the gravity, depends on the atmosphere, and, and, and so forth. That might be a sort of, so there's some tension there between contingency and necessitating forces like that. Yeah, so I, uh, there's, there's a chapter in the book where I, I deal with this. And, I, you know, I, my favorite example of convergence, it, it, convergence is absolutely true, right? It, it happens all the time. And my favorite example is how octopus eyes and human eyes are very, very similar because the eye just works. And even though there's been, you know, 500 million years of differing evolutionary history there on totally different paths, you basically get the same eye, right? So convergence is a real force. But I think this question is actually pretty well settled in my, in my opinion, and I may be an outlier on this. 
um, by uh, the long-term evolution experiment. And I, I went to Michigan State mm-hmm. and met with the people who organized this, uh, Richard Lenski and also uh, Zachary Blunt, who, who is, works with contingency very, very closely in microbes. And basically, the, 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 the short version of what they did was they had 12 versions of E. coli in a pure evolution experiment where there's no outside forces, right? So they have 12 identical cloned strands of E. coli, and they feed them this glucose solution set in the citrate solution, basically as a stabilizer, and they just see how they evolve. And like the first 15 years or so of this experiment, I think it was maybe a little longer, um, everything was convergence, right? Like the 12 lines were differing slightly, but like they were basically doing the same thing. They were getting more fit over time as they ate their glucose. And then all of a sudden, one day, one of the flasks was cloudy and they, they thought it was a mistake. They thought it had been contaminated. So they restarted it um, from, you know, a few hundred generations earlier and it turned cloudy again very shortly thereafter. So they sequenced the genome. And what they found was basically, I mean, this, this is what I find unbelievable about this experiment. What, what they found was that the one lineage had evolved the ability to eat citrate, which it was not supposed to be able to do. But the kicker was that four absolutely neutral mutations before the fifth mutation that allowed them to eat citrate happened first. So four accidents stacked on top of each other in exactly the right order leads to the fifth mutation, which then gives them an evolutionary advantage where they can eat citrate. And the reason this is important is because that one lineage is totally different forever from all the other 11, right? It's not, it's never going to go back. And none of the other 11 have evolved that ability. So what I think happens in, in the social world, in the, in the real world, et cetera, is contingent convergence. Basically, you have these little moments where things flip and a new path is charted. And then within that path, convergence happens again because there's social forces or order or some aspect that is acting on them like evolution does, pressures. But then another contingent event happens and then it diverts the trajectory again. And that's endlessly happening. And so, you know, my view is basically social science writes out the contingency and some fields, you know, might be too fixated on the, 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 um, the contingency and write out the convergence. So I think we basically need to merge them <laughs> because yeah. it's how the world yeah. actually works. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. I call that contingent necessity, but co- contingent convergence is also good. I think about the tetrapod four limb. It's a pretty contingent quirky, uh, uh, event that from tick, tick, lock, tick, was that the name of the first amphibian that walked out of the water? And we ended up with that just by chance. You know, so we have the humerus, the ulnar and radius, the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Uh, but now that we have that, it's not like we're going to have some new design that's just going to pop out because all mammals have that tetrapod forelimb. But way back when, at that moment, is when that branching fork happened. So there's the contingency. But after that, so the later the system is, you know, the more dug in the system is, the less likely little tweaks are going to bump it out of the uh, out of the canal there. Yeah, no, that, I, I agree exactly with that. And, and I think this is something where, you know, social scientists and historians um, w- would do well to read evolutionary biologists, right? Because, I mean, they're, they're part of the historical sciences. And I think that there's a lot of people who are thinking about these problems in totally disparate realms. And that was the joy of, of researching Fluke was that, you know, I mean, I don't normally... In my in my sort of role as a political scientist, I you know the the, the the sort of incentives for me are not to read evolutionary biology, and I started reading it because it fascinated me, and I just got sucked down this rabbit hole. And you know, I I think there's so many people thinking about these questions and not talking to each other, and the contingency conferences that do exist, and you know there 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 are such things, are almost exclusively evolutionary biologists, and I think it's a, it's a real shame because economics could benefit from this sociology his, you know history anthropology and uh, of course political science my own field yeah but, but you know back to the unpredictability of human behavior because the person themselves doesn't don't know what they're going to do when you were talking i was thinking about the studies on suicide you know trying to predict who might kill themselves and of course there's some big predictors extreme depression and you know stressful life event or whatever but um you know, I was reading this book on suicide, and there's a database of people who tried to kill themselves and failed. And then you ask them, well, what were you thinking? And and usually it's like, I wasn't thinking anything. I just got up and decided, today's the day. Or like, I'm going to walk across the bridge. What was the example? If, and if nobody smiles at me, I'm going to jump. And if some one person smiles, I'm not going to jump. You know, I mean, it's just like a spur of the moment thing. And and some of the explanations were, like, I don't know what came over me. I, I just I just had this moment. And so they don't even know. 
And I was thinking about that with, you know, predicting, uh, you know, sociologists that try to predict serial, not serial killers, mass public shooters. You know, and say, oh, they're broken home or they're bullied or what, you know, everybody's looking for some uh, magic bullet there, the, the X that causes the Y. And there's just no such thing, really, because you can post dick it. You can look after the, oh, the, the Columbine boys were bullied or they were into goth or they listened to this music. That's just all bullshit uh, hindsight bias. You know, how, how many people listen, you know, wear goth and listen to dark music or whatever, and they don't kill anybody, most of them. And, and the serial, these killers themselves may not know until like that day, that moment uh, that they just, they just snap and it happens. So how could, I don't know, that seems like a, a point you're making. It's not possible to predict who's going to be the next terrorist or mass public shooter or who's going to commit suicide or whatever. Yeah, so this is where I think we make a mistake because what we really want to figure out is the individual and we focus so much on the aggregate, right? And the aggregate has limits. So like, where is a coup going to happen in 2024? I can't tell you. I can tell you with a high probability it's not going to be Norway, right? So like there's correlates that we can say create risk factors. And, and you know, these are things like you have higher rates of crime in, in impoverished areas and, and social deprivation and so on. But what you actually want to figure out, the things that sort of drive society and create these pivot points are the things that are highly unpredictable individual events. So, you know, you need to know about 9-11. You don't need to know that, like, terrorism is more likely in a place with high rates of extremism, right? Because it's obvious. We, we know that terrorism is likely to emerge from places with high rates of extremism. We need to know exactly which ones, and we can't. And I, and I think this is the kind of stuff where, you know— where social science often fails. And it's not because social science is stupid. It's not like we're a bunch of idiots who have never thought about these problems. It's more just that, you know, we're, we're being tasked with doing something that I think is, is at a certain level impossible, which is trying to basically forecast the weather, you know, a year in advance. Uh, and, and I think that's what a lot of political science economic models are being asked to do because they simply can't. Now, can we within seven to 10 days? Yeah, fine. I mean, we, we, we make pretty good predictions about economics for the quarter. We, we don't, but they often are wrong, right? I mean, the, the, the predictions that were made for the second quarter of 2020 were very, very wrong because the pandemic hit. So, you know, I think there's, even then we're, there, there's limits to this in a way that's not true of the weather as much. So, you know, I, I'm just skeptical of our hubris around this. And I think that it, we would all benefit from a lack of uh, professed certainty for things that we cannot know. Yeah, I was fortunate to learn very early on when I started buying stocks and investing in the stock market that nobody could predict uh, what the stock market's going to do. And so you have these statistical models in, uh, in, in which so-and-so, like the famous Bill Miller, uh, uh, outperformed in his mutual fund, the S&P 500, for 14 years in a row. And he was declared, you know, the greatest fund manager of all time and so on. And, but in fact, there are like uh, Len, Len Milan now did this calculation in his book, uh, The Drunkard's Walk. There's 6,000 uh, hedge fund managers. <laughs> so after the fact, you can go, oh, that's the guy. But of course, starting now, which is the guy that's going to, you know, you don't know, impossible. But you can say, let's say for the last century, here's what the S&P 500 or the Fortune 500 or, or whatever the Dow does over the course of the next 30 years. It's going to go up on average 8% a year for the next 30. It'll go up and down, up and down, up and down. But it's thought to. That seems, why is that predictable? But the specifics are not. Well, even that I think is somewhat unpredictable at times because I think it depends on the frame of reference, right? This is so like the frame of reference problem exists. I'm using the weather analogy again, but it also applies to stocks where, you know, we keep hearing this thing of like it's a hundred year flood or a hundred year storm. It's like, yes. yeah, but, but like it changed, right? The climate changed. So it's not a hundred years. Now it's like in every three years. And I think there's a lot of that mistaken sort of thought that exists in 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 society in general where it's like, you think that these law, you, you, you need to know what the right reference category is. And sometimes there are none, right? There, th this is a concept of what I call uh, radical uncertainty, where uh, it's not my term, by the way. This is from uh, a, a book of that title um, by Mervyn King and John Kay called Radical Uncertainty. And they give this brilliant example where you need to be able to differentiate between problems for which the past is a guide, right? And problems for which the past is absolutely no guide. And, you know, David Hume established this idea long before uh, Mervyn King, but he's, he's, he's basically saying, look, if you're, a, if you're um, Barack Obama in the Situation Room of the White House in 2011, trying to figure out whether to give the kill order on Osama bin Laden, you have literally no information that will help you make that decision 
without uncertainty because you don't know whether he's there. You have never given a similar order. The special forces that you work with have never operated in Pakistan clandestinely. You don't know what will happen if the Pakistani army or military responds to you. There's no, there's no detail from the past. Like you can look at everything about SEAL Team 6's track record and all it will tell you is like they're good. But like <laughs> you already knew that. You already knew that they were good. So I, I think this is something where, you know, if you end up in a moment of radical uncertainty and you appreciate that it is truly uncertain, you'll make a more intelligent decision because you understand the limits of your of your sort of cognition and understanding of the situation. Where you get into trouble is where you take the long run S&P 500 view for a problem that actually is extremely volatile in the short run and all you care about is in the short run, right? And I think that's an instance where, you know, Obama was given all these probabilistic forecasts like, oh, there's a 60% chance of success. Nobody knew that. It was just a subjective probability based on confidence. And I think as long as we say that, as long as we say, look, we have no basis for this, it's like a gut, then that's fine. Because then you can make a decision with people giving you their input but like a 60% probability, I mean, come on, there's, there's absolutely no way to make that judgment because mm -hmm. it's never happened before. So uh, that's where I think the, co the cognition breaks down in a lot of social forecasting. Yeah. All right, let's apply that to uh, forecasting elections and the weather. Um, so when the weatherman says there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow, you know, people misinterpret this. They think, oh, it's going to rain in 70% of the, of the area. Or it's going to rain 70% of the time. What they're really saying is this correct that if you ran our computer models a hundred times on 70 of them, it would rain. Or since you, you talk about Nate Silver's, you know, the prediction of 2016 elections, Hillary has a 71% chance of winning. So his defense when Trump won is like, well, he, that's part of the 30%. I said he, he could win. Exactly. So this is something where the, you're, you're absolutely right about the weather. And with Nate Silver, you know, I'm not trying to pick on him specifically. This is a standard aspect of forecasting. But, you know, I mean, basically what you're saying to people, and I think this is obscured because people look at statistics and say, oh, it's scientific or it's a computer model, therefore it must be accurate, it is basically you have an average of the polls that are weighted according to Nate Silver's beliefs about their quality, often to a rigorous standard, combined with a series of sort of prior beliefs about the way American elections work, and then a series of, of thousands upon thousands of simulations. And when you do that, you come up with this number, how often Hillary Clinton loses, right? And, and very rarely in the model, I think it was 29% of the time she was going to lose. Now, Nate Silver, when she did lost, had the ready-made defense. My model did not say 100%. Well, to which I say, okay, you've created an unfalsifiable model. That's wonderful because you can never, <laughs> literally never be wrong unless you have a model that says 100%. And I will guarantee you mathematically that Nate Silver designed it to never have a 100% uh, model. And I, I, so I think the, the problem is sort of twofold. One is that when subjective probability assessments are made based on confidence judgments, they don't take into account the fact of contingent events, which Nate Silver is no better at anyone else than predicting, because one of the most important events that happened in that election was the reopening of the FBI investigation as a result of the FBI discovering new information on Anthony, Anthony Weiner's laptop, the disgraced congressman from New York. And Nate Silver didn't know that. The model didn't incorporate that. It was a contingent event, right? And it did shift the probabilities of the election outcome, but not in ways that were captured by the polls. Um, and then the second problem, the unf unfalsifiability, is that you know I think for scientific progress, you need to have falsifiable results. I think you need to be able to say we were wrong. And so you know, presidential elections are so rare that you can't calibrate them. And you know, if Nate Silver is you know is going to get it right a lot of the time, well, a lot of us are going to get it right. I mean, in two thousand eight. Most people would have gotten it right. And, and the whole, you know, sort of emergence of Nate Silver's fame came from the fact that he predicted most states correctly. But the polls basically aligned with that, right? I mean, like if, if you had just taken a crude polling average in 2008, maybe you get one or two states different from Nate Silver, but you're still probably predicting 48 out of 50 and you look like a guru, right? So, you know, I think there's some aspects of this where the veneer of hard statistics dupes people into thinking there is certainty where there isn't. And it also obscures the subjective judgments that are being made behind the scenes. And I think we need to be much clearer about what's happening in the model. Do you make reference to um, Trump's victory unpredicted by the polls, but predicted by somebody, I forget if it was a journalist or political scientist that talked to people in the rural areas of Wisconsin or wherever that was, maybe Ohio. And, you know, there's Trump signs everywhere. And th these people are just, you know, rabidly supporting Trump. It's like, 
there's something going on here that the polls aren't capturing. Yeah, so this is um, this is Catherine Kramer in Wisconsin who drove around all sorts of diners and gas stations and coffee shops and talked to ordinary people, which is very much not in vogue, by the way, in social science, uh, which I think is a mistake, by the way. Uh, and, and that's because she actually talked to the people that the polls were trying to capture and not just with questions, but, you know, spending hours with them. And she did develop some insights that I think were missing from the discourse. So what I think is important to do is basically a to say when there's a really close election, we don't know. I, I think that's the answer. I mean, I, I don't know who's going to win in 2020. Uh, sorry, 2024. I just don't. I, it's impossible Nobody to predict does. right now. It's a year out. And none of the information we have at our fingertips right now will give you a better answer. You can make a forecast, but it, it's impossible. And so that's the first admission, right? Then the second thing is, okay, take all sources of information that are possibly available. So yes, use polls. Also use surveys and questionnaires and focus groups. Use information that's gleaned from people who actually exist on the ground. Do qualitative research. Try to build theories around this. I mean, I think we have overemphasized the quantitative side because there's the, the veneer of hard data applied to it. And it means that certain kinds of information which are fallible are prioritized over other kinds of information which are also fallible. You need to be rigorous. You need to be systematic in all these things. But you know, I, I think that Catherine Kramer's insights were, u were useful. And it was our, our own stupidity to ignore them. Um, you, know, you, you don't use anecdotes to, to sort of understand the world, but she was picking up on levels of anger and rural resentment that I think were not being captured in polling and polling models because they were using that sort of what you referred to as the, the long stretch of the S&P 500 mentality. They were undercounting the number of rural voters and, and, and less well-educated voters simply because that's what happened in previous elections. And she was picking up on some highly motivated voters who fit that demographic profile, and it would have been useful to incorporate that insight into some of the polling. So, you know, I mean, forecasting is only one part of the book, but I think it is something where if you accept that the world is far more contingent, random, and driven by arbitrary and accidental chaos than models suggest, it has implications well beyond, you know, sort of how we model the world, but also sort of accepting uncertainty in our place uh, within the social world. Do you think the, um, what do they call betting markets, where people actually bet their own money on outcomes of different, there was one last week about when Claudine Gay would uh, resign from Harvard, which day it would happen. I don't know who won that one, but is that better than polling? Because at least people will have something, they have skin in the game. I mean, I think there are some instances where it has proven to be very effective, but it's completely useless in moments of radical uncertainty. And that's, that's the main point I'm trying to make, right? So yeah. like yeah. for things like, like we, we, the areas where prediction is extremely effective are the things where you have extremely stable systems, repeated games, and you have basically the rules unchanging with the same players. So sports are a great place for prediction, right? Because over the long run, you actually are very, very good at calibrating models to do this. You have the same players. The teams might shift a bit, but like basically, the, you know, the, the, the Major League Baseball team, sorry, the Major League Baseball season is just a reiteration of 162 games over and over, over and over with the same rules roughly every season. And so predictions both for forecasting models and for um, betting markets are actually very good at that. Predicting when a pandemic is going to hit, both are terrible, right? I mean, yes. it, it's impossible. Like it's literally impossible to predict when a pandemic will occur um, when you have an interconnected world in which the single infection of an individual from a mutated virus can infect literally billions of people in the span of months. And, and I think that's the kind of stuff where, you know, it's figuring out which problems are, are which kind. And if you accept moments of uncertainty, you live slightly differently, right? You, you experiment more because you understand that you might not have the ready-made solution. So one of the things that I talk about in Fluke is the value of experimentation is proportionate to the uncertainty you accept in the world. Because if you know exactly how the world works, right? If you, if you have five restaurants in your community and you've tried all of them, then you don't need to experiment anymore because you've already tried them and you know which ones have the best menu and so on. If the world is one in which there are thousands of restaurants and they're constantly changing their menus and sometimes the chefs switch and so on, you had better experiment if you want to find a really good meal. So, you know, I, I think there's aspects of this where the philosophy behind how we think the world works really does play out, not just in the hubris we take towards social modeling and political decisions and economic um, you know, calculations and so on, but also the way we live. And, and I think that's the aspects that were so interesting for me to grapple with in Fluke is like, 
I fundamentally think that the worldview that most people hold is incorrect. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, most people in, in the, in the world that I inhabit, which is social, social science. Yeah, for sure. Um, but if we're going to do a sample of something, uh, I mean, by definition, it can't be everybody, every single person in the universe. I was just thinking of this, you know, I'm, I'm 69. So I've been reading, you know, the medical predictions of prostate cancer, things like that. You know, so it's like, okay, so men that are in their 60s have this percentage probability of getting prostate or colon cancer, so I should get the colonoscopy every five years or 10 years, whatever it is. And, but, but what about, you know, men that are 69 that, that, that never smoked, that have always exercised and live in California? How about men that are 69 plus two months plus also ride their bike every day? At, at some point, we're, it's just me. There's no sample, right? So if you keep adding components to the sample, Pretty soon, it's just going to be one, and that's the. Of course, that's the what we care about. The one, not the not the whole group. That's the problem. Is that that, that difference there? Yeah. So, and this is also where I, I sort of dis differentiate in the argument between problems that need to be answered and problems that need not be answered. Right. Mm. So, a problem that need not be answered is forecasting Burundi's GDP growth in mm. 2030. A problem that need be answered is what should you do if you are given information that suggests that you face a high risk of cancer. Right now, additionally, with cancer, you know, there is a, a through line to scientific research with this, the aspects of sort of stability across human bodies. And what I mean by that is like, you know, if you're trying to understand vinegar and baking soda and whether they're going to fizz, you can basically assume that whether it's me or you doing it and whether it's, you know, somebody 200 years doing it with the same chemical compounds, that it's going to fizz. Right. Because there's interchangeability there. Mm -hmm. And this is generally true, not perfectly true at the individual level, but generally true across large groups of humans. So if you're trying to understand, you know, forecasting around prostate cancer, it makes complete sense to focus on things tied to aggregations of individuals and patterns. The question is, you know, what are you supposed to do as a sort of social forecaster for larger problems that are swayed by small effects in, in the real world in a highly complex universe of 8 billion people? which is things like forecasting economic calamities, terrorist attacks, pandemics, right? I mean, th there's a difference between the stability that exists in aggregations of patterns across human bodies and the social world and how we sort of look at the sort of global instability that we face. And, and I think that there's, there's sort of a limit here that we're not acknowledging. You know, like it keeps happening that social science has these reckonings where it's like, oh, why did we get it wrong? Oh, we didn't have the right model or we didn't take this variable into account. And I, I'm saying something different. I'm saying something I think that's much more difficult for people to internalize, but it's like, I don't think we can predict social change over the long run because I don't think we can predict the calamities and upheavals that often reorder society that are very, very often produced by small events. Right. And, and small changes that could have been otherwise. I mean, you think about Osama bin Laden, he might have been killed in the 1980s during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the sort of resistance he had. Would 9-11 have happened? OK, that's the bigger effect. But I talk in, you know, in fluke about what if the weather had been bad on 9-11? On I mean, it was a blue sky day, so all the planes took off at the same time. Would the terrorist attack have been foiled if some of them had been grounded because there was a storm? I mean, these are the kinds of things where we don't know. Would the White House or the Capitol have been destroyed if a different set of passengers had been on uh, Flight 93, which is down in, in Pennsylvania? We don't know, right? But like the world would be different if the White House had been blown up. So, I, you know, these are the kinds of things where I think there's a sort of radical uncertainty that, that is simply ironed out of, of modeling. And it's not to say that modeling is useless. It's to say that we need to recognize that the model is not the world. And that once you grapple with that and you look at how the world actually works, the, the, the role of chance and chaos and contingency just hits you in the face. And, and that's what I'm trying to, to get across. Yeah. And you do it very well. But I guess the problem, if you're a public policy advisor or a politician and you're there at the press conference and, and you're asked, what are you going to do to prevent another 9-11? I mean, you can't just say, well, it's not possible. Uh, you know, I mean, or just like, what are you going to do about uh, gun violence? Nothing. There's nothing to be done. I mean, they just really literally can't say that because it's their job to do something, right? Yeah, so, so problems on the social level are highly possible to tackle with levels of foresight and also with policy intervention. So gun, gun violence is a good example, right? You can't predict exactly where the next 
um, you know, mass shooting is going to happen. You can predict that if you have extremely lax gun laws and you let 330 million guns flow into a country or 400 million guns rather fl flow into a country of 330 million people, that more gun violence is going to happen than in places that have strict gun laws, right? So it's not to throw your hands up and do nothing. It's to say, if you accept that there is some level of uncertainty, then you build more resilience into your systems. So one of the other things I talk about in Fluke, and this is true for both, op uh, both for social systems and for our own lives, is that if you have a sense of certainty, you reduce the prominence of resilience and you race towards optimization, right? So you, you figure you understand the system. Like if you have a, a jet engine and you do understand, it's a very complicated system, but you understand how it works. You want to optimize it. There's no reason not to optimize it. You might have some fail safes in place, but you don't have a hundred fail safes in place because you actually understand it, right? Whereas if you're in a world of complete uncertainty, you're going to dial down the optimization and ratchet up the resilience. And my point, which is, I think, important for policymakers to take into account, is if you accept what I'm saying, that the world is far more uncertain and swayed by contingency than, than you imagine, you need to focus a hell of a lot more on resilience and also reduce your appetite for optimization. I mean, I think this is something we saw with the Suez Canal recently, where a single boat, right, one boat gets stuck and it causes like literally billions of dollars of economic damage and delays because the world was so hyper-optimized that it had no slack. And the, the, the sort of modern social systems we inhabit are built that way. They race towards optimization and then they collapse. And then they race towards optimization right after the collapse and it happens again. And so, you know, there, there's this realm of physics that rose in the 1980s um, from Perbach and the, 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 what's called the sand pile model, um, which I think is a very important way of thinking about social systems as well, which is that, you know, as grains of sand build up into a pile, eventually one grain is going to cause the collapse of the entire pile. But which one caused it? All of them, right? And it became more likely because you optimized the absolute limit. If you didn't, if you went, you know, 10% below the collapse threshold, each grain of sand would be less risky. So, you know, my view on this in, in terms of resilience and optimization is that it is derived from an accurate recognition of uncertainty. And that's what's missing from, from our assessment of how reality operates. Yeah. Okay, let's go back in time to, let's say, February 2020. You're Anthony Fauci. And there's something going on here. What should we do? Should we, or make it March, let's say. You know, should we close the schools, shut down the economy, force everybody to stay home, mass mandates, vaccines when we get them? Or do you come out and go, well, you know, we just don't really know. And then maybe what? Go, go more Bayesian? Like, well, at what, from what we know today, this is my recommendation. You know, just... Close the schools, but keep the restaurants up, whatever it is. And, and then, may, but we may change our mind next week or something like that. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is where the experimentation would go in, right? I, th I think first off, what you'd say, uh, you'd level with people and you say, look, this has never happened before. And we don't exactly know or understand everything about the virus. We have models that suggest that this is very dangerous and we will therefore be taking significant measures to try to reduce the spread of it. Here's what we're planning to do. Um, here's the areas of uncertainty, and this is why we're going to have a few different public health responses in different places, and we're going to trial them to figure out what's most effective. Now, whether people would accept that or not, I don't know. I mean, that's a question about behavioral economics, because of course, people want to be told this is the best solution and you're not a guinea pig. I mean, the, the idea of being a guinea pig during a pandemic is very scary. But, you know, I use this in, the, towards the end of the book. I, I, I draw on the story that I think it sounds unrelated, but I promise I'll bring it back to the pandemic. Um, it, it's about sort of these tribes in, in this area where they cultivate both rice and, and rubber. And basically, the, one of the crops the, the sort of, uh, is extremely predictable. And the other crop, it, it's very difficult to know what conditions make it best for it to grow because the weather affects its growing very, very significantly. And the point is that the, the, the groups in that society that do best are the ones that simply experiment. And the way they experiment is a highly irrational way. They plant based on the perceived movement of a certain number of sacred birds. But what they've accidentally done is they've engineered a random number generator, basically, right? Because the, the, the birds they've picked are effectively random. Their movements are effectively random. And the diversification of attempts means that they're actually highly resilient to an uncertain environment. And so, you know, when it comes to things like a, a moment of radical uncertainty around a pandemic, you might have four or five or six public health responses that you think are highly effective. Uh, and I think it's important to sort of trial them and figure out what works best because the, 
that's the kind of stuff that actually gives us data that's useful. I mean, as a side note, this is totally separate from what I'm talking about in Fluke. You know, I think there was a role, a bigger role for um, challenge trials and things with experimentation of, you know, deliberate infection under extremely controlled circumstances for low risk individuals who volunteered uh, to be studied, including with things like masks, um, where you could have tested the rates of infectiousness with people who use different kinds of masks to shut up the anti-mask people once and for all. Um, but, you know, I mean, that, that's a, a bit of an aside. My, my point generally is saying that if you accept uncertainty and you don't project this era of false, un false certainty, which we fundamentally didn't have, you can actually get better results faster. Here, maybe we could use the, the comparison, comparative method uh, of natural experiments that already happened. Let's say some states close down more than other states, keep things open, and then you see what the differences are in the outcome. Is the problem there that not all states are uh, of the same people, ages, uh, I don't know, whatever other policies they may have that could contaminate the XY causal connection you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's, you still use that information. I mean, of course, in hindsight, and when we evaluate how to avoid the mistakes of, of the COVID pandemic for future pandemics, then yes, obviously, natural experiments are an important data point. They're not the end all be all. I mean, one of the points that I often say with Sweden, which is brought up all the time, I mean, I, I'm not a public health expert, so I'm not, I, I'm not going to weigh in too much on you know the virtues of lockdowns and so on. But one point I do make as a social scientist, when you look at a place like Sweden, which had very limited forced lockdowns, is that levels of social trust there are off the charts. And the government yeah. basically said, look, this is dangerous. And so people, when you look at things like cell phone data, um, started behaving in ways that were actually more convergent with places that had lockdown, even though they weren't required, right? And, and, and so, you know, it looks like on paper, oh, wow, you know, we shouldn't have done this. But in the United States, if you didn't have these sort of um, government mandates and so on for some things early on or in, in Europe and so on, would you have had the same levels of social trust and voluntary compliance with some regulations that public health experts were saying, particularly when a certain segment of the population wanted to actually murder the public health expert who was in charge of the response, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a very different societies. But yeah, I mean, I think basically when you try to evaluate what worked and what didn't, then you use all the possible information and, you, and natural experiments is one of the data points I would look at. Yeah. Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, was debating my governor here, uh, Newsom of California. And and that was one of his points. Look, we kept Florida open and, and, and our rates were better than your rates or whatever, but there's so many other variables there. It's really hard to know. It's, it reminds me of when I, I did a series of debates with uh, uh, John Lott, the economist who wrote that book, More Guns, Less Crime. So his th thesis is that uh, the more armed people are, the less uh, crime there is because criminals are less likely to target uh, homes or neighborhoods where everybody's armed or even states. And uh, so I, I really looked into the social science data of gun control studies, and it is a, just a rat's nest of tangled variables. I just, so of course, when we were debating, I picked all the studies that showed, you know, more gun control is good, not abandoning the Second Amendment, none of that, just, you know, just some modest gun control. Of course, he picks all the ones, studies that showed uh, support for his thesis. This is your point about the problem of social scientists. The social science is that there, if you have a complex social issue like, gun violence. There's, you know, a hundred variables plus all the random contingent stuff that it's pretty much impossible to, to, to say for sure what's the right thing to do. Yeah. So, so, so later on in Fluke, I have a, a chapter where I deal, I, this is not going to make me many friends in the quantitative social science world, but the chapter is titled, um, the emperor's new equations. Oh yes. And, uh, one of the things but that it's I, all true. I sort of everything you said in there, it's true. <laughs> yeah, well, it's. <laughs> I still think it's not going to make me popular at the conferences, um, but it's you know I, I differentiate between uh, what I call the easy problem of social research and the hard problem of social research. And the easy problem is stuff like the gun control aspect that you're identifying, which is you know you can be smarter about variable identification and so on, and not do stupid things like try to say, oh, what what are the gun murder rates in Chicago compared to you know, uh, rural areas when the, the urban density in Chicago is so much higher, but also their gun control laws don't stop people who are criminals from getting guns 10 minutes away in Indiana, right? I mean, there's like, there's all these things where people make sloppy mistakes in, in their research. And that's the easy problem. I think it's solvable. We can get better at it. The hard problem comes from this paper that I, you know, I wish it got, I hope, I hope I help popularize it um, called the universe of uncertainty paper. And what these, what these researchers did was so smart. They, they, 
They said, let's, let's look at a standard problem that perplexes social researchers, which is, does higher levels of, does higher levels of immigration reduce um, sort of support for social safety net programs, right? In other words, and the sort of hypothesis would be that if lots of immigrants are coming into your community, you don't want to have all your tax money go to help the immigrants, right? That would be the, the sort of theory. And what was amazing was they had all these different research teams. I think there's 72 research teams in total that dealt with the exact same data and the exact same question. And, you know, they sort of figured like, okay, we're going to like crowdsource this. So we'll like figure out the answer. What they found, I think, should shake social science to the core and give us a lot of soul, soul searching to do. Because what they basically found was about half of the research teams found no effect. But a quarter of the research teams found a positive effect and a quarter of the research teams found a negative effect. And they plotted all of the different methodological variables and they still could only explain when they looked back with hindsight. You know, to, you think, okay, maybe we can go back and figure out what happened. The researchers who actually commissioned the study said that they could only explain about 5% of the variance in the results. And that 95% was a black hole where they just, they didn't understand it, right? But the real problem here is not just that there's this massive amount of uncertainty, which I, I, that's important. It's that when social research is actually done, one research team answers the question with their own data, right? And then it becomes settled science. It's like, you know, okay, well, they did the study and they found this. And then maybe 20 years later, somebody will revisit the question and see, oh, did it change or whatever, right? But like what this study is showing us is that you have a significant chance that it would go one way or the other, because if it was in the 50% in the middle where there was no effect, it probably wouldn't get published, right? There's publication bias where the stuff that finds no, a null result usually doesn't end up in journals. So you've got like a 50-50 chance that it's a positive effect or a negative effect. And whatever it is, that becomes like the, the mantra of, the, of like the way the world is. And then the problem is like also the data is from one place. So like, what if the question is totally different if you answer this in, you know, Norway compared to the United States? We don't know, right? So like, <laughs> there's just so many layers of uncertainty on top of uncertainty where contingent choices among data collection, methodology, researcher choices, researcher bias, they all are layered on top of each other. And then that's how we construct our findings about the world. So it's not to say we shouldn't do the research, right? It's just, again, like the replication crisis created a lot of soul searching in psychology and other social science, which was like, why was this happening? I think the universal uncertainty paper, if people knew about it, would create some serious soul searching in how we did more crowdsourced um, research to figure out whether our findings are real or whether they're contingent on methodological choices and data selection. Yeah, I think here we can invoke Donald Rumsfeld and, and say, well, we have our known knowns and our known unknowns, but what you're saying with the hard problem here is that there may just be known unknowables. We will never know. And here I was thinking of, uh, Steve Pinker and I were t talking about this recently because he does a lot of behavior genetic stuff. You know, you get like identical twins raised in the same home and they're like 0.74 correlation on personality characteristics and, and whatnot. Why are they not 100%? Why is it not a one? <laughs> same genes. Well, Steve thinks, you know, that there's actually like contingent quirky events like in the womb or, you know, this one neuron goes this way and the other neuron and the other twin goes that way. And and there's just randomness to this. So you get this non-shared environment. There's something that n no social scientist knows or pr pr probably will never know why they're not identical when everything else is held constant. You have your cater this parabus, you know, all of the things being constant, but they're not always, con they're never constant. Yeah, so I, I, I love that question because I, I completely agree with Steven Pinker on this. And I think the, a lot of the scientific evidence does too, right? So um, first off, there's loads of evidence about this that seems to exist with, with, with human brains derived from studies from uh, other animals. For, for example, I mentioned in Fluke, there's studies on flies that find that if you clone the same fly, basically, they will behave differently from tiny fluctuations in uh, their development, right? And you can't predict it at all. But there's an amazing creature, which I just find extraordinary, and it links back to my, uh, some of my research I previously did on despots, which is in Madagascar. So uh, I, I went to Madagascar a whole bunch of times, eight times or nine times for research to study the politics. And, you know, like a decade ago, I started seeing these crayfish called marmor crabs. I didn't know what they were called at the time. 
But I started reading up on them and I included them as the opening to a chapter in Fluke because they just utterly fascinate me. And basically the short version of the story is at one point, this crayfish in, as far as we can tell, according to science uh, research on this, one of them in a German pet shop in 1995 may or may not have had the aquarium temperature turned up slightly and its offspring had a genetic mutation that allowed it to clone itself. So asexual reproduction, right? So all these marmot crabs are effectively genetically identical and they don't require any sort of mating to reproduce, which means their populations can explode. And this, this is one of the things that's like layered contingency upon contingency upon contingency. Because then in Madagascar, they get introduced, right? Now, first off, when people have studied the marmot crabs in a lab, epigenetics, the sort of, you know, black box that's a lot of research is focusing on now that, that sort of tries to explain these differences among seemingly genetically identical organisms. Um, it's looking at the marmot crabs and they're like radically different. They're completely the same genetically. And some of them are like many sizes bigger. They have totally different organ function. Like all these things biologically about them diverge, even when they're raised in the same sterile environment and are given the same diet with genetic identical, you know, genetically identical genomes. And then on top of that, you know, you have the contingency for the social world because this single marmot crab in Germany leads to offspring that somehow make their way to Madagascar and it starts to wipe out the rice fields, which are part of Madagascar's economy. But on the flip side, they're like this really great form of cheap protein for a severely malnourished population, which needs protein. So like, and it also kills this parasite that, that kills lots of kids. So you have like these ripple effects where like the rice crop is, get, is getting hurt, but malnourishment is decreasing, a parasite is getting killed off, and all of it is traced back to one genetic mutation in a German pet shop in 1995. And I look at that story as a social researcher trying to understand modern Madagascar, and I'm like, okay, where do I put this in the model, right? Like wh where's the variable that's like the 1995 German pet shop mutation? And that's, the, that's really what I'm talking about with Fluke. It's like, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's that these things get like sort of, reflected away from us in this funhouse mirror of reality that we see in modeling. Whereas like the more you scrutinize the real world, the modeling way of thinking just makes no sense, right? Cause like Madagascar's economy is being affected by this and the GDP forecasts are being affected by crayfish. So, you know, it's something where uh, I think we could, could all learn a bit from that parable of the marmot crab. Well, I like your story about the Jack Russell terrier. I, I had no <laughs> idea there was a guy named Jack Russell and that was his dog. And the dog was named Trump. <laughs> Come on. What? <laughs> yeah, this is this is another one of my favorite stories from the book. I, I went down it, researching this book was the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. I must say, like for as a professional thing, it was so interesting because like I, you know, I go in this rabbit hole of the evolution of modern dogs and I read book upon book about this right? Like for like what is ultimately like 500 words in the text of Fluke. But uh, it's fascinating because it's basically, it, it links to this idea of what I call lock-in, right? Which is where contingent yeah. convergence, you said contingent necessity earlier, um, interacts with sort of deliberate choices. So like, you know, there's all these dogs that are evolving, but then eventually what happened in the Victorian era of Britain was a lot of bored aristocrats basically decided as a hobby to decide what a breed was. And before that, dogs were mostly referred to as races and they were almost exclusively categorized by their function and never, their, never their form, right? So like retrievers existed, but like it's because they were good at retrieving. Whereas like these aristocrats set up very specific breed definitions based on physical characteristics. And, th and the second that happened, they were locked in. So like the Jack Russell Terrier is literally a guy named Jack Russell. He was a parson outside of Oxford. His dog was called Trump and every Jack Russell Terrier is derived from Trump. Sorry about that for all the <laughs> Jack Russell owners who are listening. But, uh, you know, you also have, I have a border collie and the reason he looks the way he does is because he's derived from a single very good uh, herding dog on the Scot border of Scotland and England named Old Hemp. That's the origin of all border collies. And his ears are the way they are because there was something, believe it or not, called the Great Collie Ear Trial where uh, a collie was sold to someone and the guy said, I don't think this is a real collie who fits the breed standard that's been set up by this new thing, you know, the sort of the, the definition of what the breed is. So they went to trial and, you know, that locked in what the breed was because you could get sued um, for sort of fraudulent sale of an animal if you didn't meet the breed specification. So you know, we have like this explosion of, of varieties of dogs, but like they're all actually locked into these patterns, which are a contingent accent of Victorian era social history. And that is partly derived from the fact that that's the same time that social science was born, where everyone wanted to measure everything. 
right? So like the sort of rise of Francis Galton and all these people is, is correlated in my view with the uh, decision to sort of lock in and measure dog breeds. And you, you, know, you look around you, every dog you see is a byproduct of an accident to Victorian era Britain. I mean, contingency upon contingency upon contingency. Yeah, lock in, uh, QWERTY keyboard is always the classic example yeah. of this. You know, we're still using it. I guess the explanation is that it, it's not bad. It's pretty good. I mean, it's good enough. Uh, you know, you could type 60, I could type 60, 80 words a minute pretty well. Maybe there's a keyboard I could do 90 words a minute, but who cares? I don't really need that. And I don't want to learn a whole new system. On the other hand, how come we're not still using Betamax or VHS tapes or CDs for that matter? So sometimes things do change radically. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, there, there's when there's good reason for something to shift and it comes with a lower cost, then, then lock-in is only so powerful, right? I mean, maybe there will be new, new dog breeds and so on. Maybe the keyboards will shift. But I think the QWERTY keyboard is actually an interesting example because, you know, I think there's this belief in evolutionary biology, which is, you know, I'm, I'm getting outside my own realm and in, in, in pontificating on this, but where, you know, sort of everything is sort of optimized for survival of the fittest and a lot of this stuff, you know, sort of drifts towards ever fitter states. There's a lot of stuff that's just sort of good enough, right? And, and like the QWERTY keyboard is just good enough. Now, when it comes to Betamax and VHS, like it's not good enough because the human eye can see better images than what's able to be produced. At some point, it's possible that, you know, video will hit the limit of the human eye. And when that happens, maybe there won't be optimization further because we already have the players that deal with, you know, digital streaming or whatever, and we don't need it. I mean, who knows whether there's gonna be holograms and all this type of stuff, I don't know. But my point is that like, you know, if there is genuinely an improvement that affects the outcome that we care about, in this case, you know, the perception of visual images on a screen, then yeah, lock-in will die. But if there's not, like the QWERTY keyboard, where all of us have learned how to do it and actually has quite a high cost to retraining ourselves on how to type, then it could survive for a really long time. And it has, right? I mean, the irony of the QWERTY keyboard, I wrote about this in Corruptible when, when explaining path dependency, but the irony of it was it was designed to be inefficient, right? Because it was for uh, typewriters that jammed. Yeah, and so right. they came yeah. up with a, a strategy that would actually reduce the jamming by making people slow down when typing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let me ask you about um, frequency type probability versus belief type probability. Tell me if I'm getting this right. All right, I have a, I have a quarter here. So we have uh, George Washington on, on the head side, and I have on the back side the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. So it shows a soldier there with the little jets. Okay, so if I flip the coin and go, all right, you call it. Go ahead, call it. Heads. All right. What are the chances you got that right? What's the probability you got it right? Yeah. So it's 50, 50, <laughs> it's 50, 50 over the long run. It's completely uncertain in the short run. Right. right. Um, but that is a, that's a great realm for frequentist type probability, uh, as <laughs> I'm heads. sure you know. So it was heads. Yeah. yeah so, it, it, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's such a weird thing because, you know, once I flip it, it's not 50, 50, it's a hundred percent, but I just, so here, what we're saying is it, it, it's the probability is of my ignorance. I just don't yes. know what it is. The yes. events already happened, right? Yes. Is that well, the right way also, to say I mean, it? It's also, it's, it's a case where I think it's where we misunderstand what randomness really is, right? Because like, that's not, it's not also not truly random. If you, if you did the exact same thing with the quarter, with the exact same forces of acting on it in the exact same conditions, it would be heads again, right? I mean, that, that, that's, it's a deterministic event. It's a, it's a, it, it abides by the laws of physics. Randomness there is referring to our ignorance. We, we, there's so much sensitivity to conditions, tiny fluctuations in how much force you use and so on, the, the you know, airspeed, whatever it is, that we can't predict it. But frequentist prob type probability is very, very good at coin flip prediction, you know, sort of over the long run in terms of what the proportion will be, as we all know. And that's why it's always used because, you know, you can tell, you, you can't tell with one coin flip, with a single coin flip, you can't tell whether the coin is unfair or fair. It could be shaved down. It could be manipulated. With one coin flip, there is no information that would tell you that. Over a thousand coin flips, you probably can start to get a better guess, right? Um, and that's where the frequentist type probability is very, very useful. The more that a repeated event happens of a similar kind, the more that frequentist type probability is useful. Confidence type probability is a totally different kind of thinking, which is based on a series of assessments that are subjective, right? And so like the example I use in Fluke to explain this, I mean, I'm not, I'm not covering any new ground here, by the way. Ian Hacking covered all this stuff brilliantly in his writing. Uh, 
but a lot of people still mis mistake this. So I wanted to, to, to make sure that we're on the same page. But, you know, there's an example that I, I came across where it says, you know, Confucius was a real person with a 60% probability. It's not a coin flip, right? He, he was or he wasn't. It's not like there's 60% of worlds in which Confucius existed. He either existed or he didn't. The 60% number is a subjective confidence type probability based on the available evidence, how certain we can be. And the thing that I think screws people up here, right, where, where we, like, we make serious mistakes as individuals in our own lives or in, in assessing data in the real world is when we don't figure out which one's which. And we use the same terms, right? Like, I mean, I think it's a huge mistake that we use the same terms to describe frequentist and confidence type probabilities because they're utterly, utterly different. If, if someone used confidence type probability when you thought it was frequentist, you would make a very big mistake because you would think it was based on repeated trials. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's just on sort of subjective opinions of available information. So, you know, I think these are the kinds of things where we have to be clearer when we communicate data um, about uncertainty in the, in the real world. Yeah, I was thinking of that um, the medical example that's often used. I think Tversky and Kahneman did, did this example of how people get this problem wrong. So the rate of breast cancer is 1%. The, uh, the, the test for it is 90% um, uh, uh, certain. The false positive rate is 10%. I think that was the numbers or something. A woman tests positive. What are the probabilities she has cancer? And people always say, well, it's like 90%. You know, and it turns out it's 9%. Why do they get this wrong? Well, the base rate neglect, it's only 1%. But also, what do you mean a woman has cancer? She either does or doesn't. She can't have 90% she has cancer. She either does or she doesn't. The number, the original numbers were on, you know, 1,000 a, a women or 10,000 women. And, and that's, is that the, what you're talking about there? Frequency versus, you know, belief probabilities? Yeah, so, so frequency type probabilities are very, very useful for things like cancer rates because they can look at a problem over time. Confidence type probability is if you say, I have cancer, right? Like it, you either do or you don't, as you say, it's, it's, it's an objective fact about your body. And if you have not done tests, you can have a confidence based on, you know, rough approximations, but you don't know. I think the, 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 to, to me though, I think that you, the Confucius example is, is the clearest one because it's so clearly one where frequentist type probability is obviously useless, right? Like you just, you can't rerun the world 10 million times and see how often Confucius exists. So, you know, what we're talking about probabilistically there is just like based on the event, the same, you know, the Bin Laden example I gave you before, there's a 60% chance of probability, or there's a 60% probability that Osama Bin Laden is in his compound, Mr. President, completely confidence-based, no frequentist, right? You, 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 you don't know. You have information, you have intelligence, and you, you, you're not flying blind, it's based on something. But it is a subjective assessment of the available information, and it's not an accurate assessment necessarily. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a guess based on um, the data you have. All right, let's do the rewind the tape and play it back again experiment. Uh, this is always one of my favorites from, from Steve Gould. Although he, uh, Dan Dennett pointed out, well, if it's a read-only memory tape and you play it back, it's going to be exactly <laughs> the way it was because it's just a recording of what actually happened. Well, of course, what Gould meant was, you know, just rewind the timeline and play it again. And all those contingent, we, we wouldn't have anything like, well, of course, now there's that debate, we'll get back to where we were, convergent evolution. No, there wouldn't be homo sapiens, but there could be something like a big brain, bipedal something or other, could be a reptile or whatever. Something like that. Maybe, I think Gold would say probably, still probably not. But in any case, in terms of personal lives, so you rewind your own tape at the beginning there uh, that, you know, you were born because of these things that happened, you know, a century ago. But that would, would that not be true for whatever happened? Um, and it, it, if it wasn't you, it'd be somebody who was pretty similar to you genetically or whatever, your father's son, slightly different. And that person would feel the exact same way. Yeah, so this is you know, your first off. Your your line about the tape is why the <laughs> I rewrote the first line of the book slightly because people said, "Oh, you know, younger readers won't know what what does rewinding tape, tape mean." <laughs> right. um, so so the first line of fluke is if you rewind if you rewound your life to the very beginning or re rewind your life to the very beginning and then press play, would everything turn out the same? And it's riffing on Gould's um, you know thought experiment. Now this is where things get very difficult to explain precisely for me, and I'm worried about making this clear. So I simultaneously believe that if you changed anything about the past, the future would shift drastically. 
right? That's what that's what I believe through chaos theory. So that's why I think contingency plays an enormous role in in the tape, uh, as it were. And if if you change anything about my life, I think my life would unfold really differently. And I, and I mean anything. Like I, I quite literally mean whether I hit the snooze button, you know, when I was 13 years old. Um, at the same time, and this is where you know we get into the rabbit hole of of philosophy. I don't believe in free will, and I do believe in determinism. <laughs> so. I don't think that my life could have been different because I don't see a way of altering the tape, as it were. Uh, I, I, I do see, and I think this is something where, you know, I may, I may lose some people, but I, I do think that basically the Big Bang happens, you know, or something like it. And then there's just a series of reactions that are occurring, including us, right? I, I think of my brain as a very, very complex chemical system um, attached to a very, very complex body in a very, very complex social world. But that complexity doesn't negate the fact that I personally don't believe that I have independent control over those causal events separate from my physical being, which is what, you know, libertarian free will uh, would suggest. So, you know, whether you're a compatibilist or who, who believes that you can both have free will and determinism or you're a hard determinist who believes that's nonsensical, who doesn't believe in free will, uh, either way, my personal view is that we can't change the tape. Um, so, you know, it creates this really weird juxtaposition of ideas in Fluke because, like, on the one hand, everything in Fluke is about how if you changed anything, everything would be different, right? And the contingencies of the past. But at the same time, I'm, you know, my philosophy, <laughs> according to uh, my, my lack of belief in free will, means, like, yeah, I think that if you actually had the world in 1986 when I was born exactly the same uh, as it was with the exact same, and I mean literally exact, right, down to every atom, then I think I would have turned out the same. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's my answer to the question I yeah, opened the book with. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's come back to the free will uh, question in, in a minute, but let's go back and, and do the baby, would you kill baby Hitler experiment you talk about. Um, you know, uh, you don't even have to do that. You could just say, you know, he was born five minutes later or his father didn't die uh, or, you know, whatever. Uh, but it depends on when the little contingent event happens. You know, let's say fast forward to the July 20, 1944 bomb plot that didn't kill Hitler, had it killed him. Well, the war would have ground on from the Soviet Union side, probably maybe finished within six months or so. Maybe the Nazi, the new leaders would have made peace or something like that. But still, I don't know, maybe 5.5 million Jews would have died anyway by then. I think the Auschwitz killing was pretty much done by July of 44. You know, and but but had the previous assassination attempts on Hitler's life taken place in the 30s, you know, when he started annexing um, like uh, Austria and the Sudetenland, there's stories about how several of his generals had pl planned to assassinate him had the French and the British intervened because they knew they weren't ready for war. That would have you know saved six million Jews. It would. So it depends on when the little quirky thing happens in the system. Uh, it's too late by the time it's, you know, 1944, killing Hitler does, is going to make a big difference for what's already happened. Yeah, so this is this is where, you know, the the theory of how you would test this um, is is largely impossible or impractical in the social world, but it is possible in a way in a lab. And uh, Zach Blunt, the guy that I was talking about from the long-term evolution experiment, he explicitly writes about these D-Day comparisons in World War II and then the same sort of idea as, you know, uh, Hitler gets assassinated in, in, in 1944 or, you know, slight changes to how things happen in 1939 and so on with the Munich conference. And what basically he did with the um, with the mutation I talked about, you remember, the, just to, to reiterate, there's one line of E. coli that has this freak mutation that allows us to eat citrate. What's cool about their experiment is they can they can freeze every 500 generations of E. coli, so they literally can replay the tape, right? Mm. They can look back and take any snapshot in the evolutionary history, which, you know, it's like about, I think it's 1.2 million human years of evolution is what they've now done in the E. coli's lifespan since the 1980s. So they can look at like any snapshot in time and, and like replay it and say, okay, how often does the citrate mutation emerge? And like, okay, let's tweak it slightly. Like, what if, what if we tweak things a little bit? Does it increase or decrease the likelihood of this? So what's the important aspect of this? The reason I think that's so important for the way we think about history is because that's actually the logic we would use to determine whether the assassination plot on Hitler would have radically affected the war. Now, 
the crucial point, and this is one I, t- I talked to Zach about this um, you know, a few months ago, and we agree completely on this, is that we tend to think about outcomes in society as binaries, right? So like, how did the war end is a binary answer. The, you know, either the allies win or the allies lose, right? Okay, so let's accept that Hitler dying in 1944 would have still produced the generally same outcome. The mistake that we make, I think, is that that doesn't mean that nothing else changes, right? Like if Hitler died in 1944, I think the aftermath of World War II would have been different. I think everything would have been different in Germany. I think there would have been so many shifts that we couldn't foresee. And so what we tend to do when we sort of look at history is we we put things into discrete boxes, but the world's not in boxes. So like who won the presidential election in 2016? Okay, yes, there's two options. But like if Hillary Clinton had won by 100,000, uh, sorry, if Hillary Clinton had lost by 100,000 more votes, it might have shifted things uh, a little bit more, right? I mean, we, we can't say. Um, if the election had been one day different, we, ca- we can't say, even if she's still lost, would it have changed things? If 9-11 had happened on 9-12, would the world be different? I think, yes, even if it had the exact same outcome in terms of the buildings that collapsed, different people would have died. And so, you know, the, the way I describe this, I know it's a little bit like sort of cute and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, thought experimenty, but I still think it's useful is I, I, I say in chapter one of the book, you know, like when we think about time travel and everyone says like, don't squish the wrong bug because you might accidentally <laughs> delete yourself from the future. Like all of us accept that. Like we accept this is the way the world is like, oh, yeah, like if you change the past, you might radically change um, your future, which is now our present. But like, why don't we think about that in our present? Right. Because <laughs> if like if a squished bug in the past can affect the future, then a squished bug in the present can affect the future, too. And like one of those two has to be wrong. Either our view of how time travel would operate is completely wrong, which I don't think is true. I think we're actually right about that. Or every single thing we do is important. And that's why the subtitle of the book includes the phrase why everything we do matters, because I think we are constantly redirecting the future of the world with every snooze button we choose to hit or not. And that's terrifying because everything's important. But it also is very empowering, in my opinion, because Nothing we do is unimportant, which is, uh, to, to my mind, something that's a very comforting thought. Well, I, of course, I love that. Everybody should love that. Like uh, uh, that movie, Wonderful Life, you know, that you know, every little thing uh, that somebody does, you know, changes the future. But it depends on when it happens. Again, it you know, depends on when you squash the bug, whether it matters or not. Here, uh, I was thinking of your uh, example that I've also written about, a Special Order 191 at the crucial moment uh, before the Battle of Antietam, Sharpsburg, in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, You go ahead and tell the story, because you uh, you had details I didn't even know about. Yeah, so it's basically, you know, the the, the short version of the story, which lots of people have written about, um, and and your article on it is absolutely brilliant, people should look it up, um, is that you have the situation where a a person in the uh, Union Army basically finds these discarded cigars, Right. And it turns out that they are the, the, the marching orders for the Confederate forces right before Antietam, which then allows the, the, the Union Army to basically change trajectory and, and, and fight at Antietam. It's a very important piece of information that was wrapped around these cigars, which were discarded by the person transporting them. Um, the thing that I love, the, the detail I added was that there was a question when the cigars uh, were found, whether the orders were genuine, whether they were a trap, whether it was just something they could ignore and so on. And so there was a signature at the bottom of the letter with the orders. And the person who received the cigars first happened to be the only person in the Union Army who could say with certainty whether the signature was genuine, because in his previous life as a bank teller, (laughs) he had seen that signature signed off on all sorts of pay slips by the same person who signed it literally hundreds of times. So his Bayesian inference was very high that these were genuine orders and the Union Army changed its marching orders as a result of this. Um, you know, I, this is the kind of thing where I'm, I'm curious to see where you're going with this in terms of the timing, because I, I think it is obviously very important. But I still think that if they had found different orders at a different time, it would have affected the war in some way or the aftermath of the war in some well, way. Well, my, my, my point there is is uh, that at that particular moment, it wasn't clear who was going to win the war. You know, England was contemplating recognizing the South as a sovereign nation, which would have given them um, some, uh, I guess, support from England to b- make shipping blockades of ports in the north and open up trade routes for s- southern trade of cotton to England and so on and so forth. That could have tilted it there. But let's say this 
Special Order 191 happens in the middle of Sherman's march to the sea when the war is pretty much done and he's just destroying everything. It doesn't matter who finds what plans. It's over <laughs> right by then. Uh, and it's, I was thinking of the Battle of Midway because uh, that's one of my favorite stories and there's great movies about it. The reason we focus on that so much is because it wasn't at all clear what was going to happen in the Pacific War. And, you know, the United States only had a couple of carriers. It was all on the line. The Japanese had six carriers. We had four carriers and four. And it was four and three, I guess. And anyway, th this led to that and this quirky thing. And like in five minutes, the whole thing turned on five minutes where the Japanese had the wrong planes that they were reloading from torpedoes to bombs, but it should have been the other way around, and boom, and it's over. You know, but by, say, uh, early 1945, you know, when we're island hopping toward Japan, it, it's over. It, 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 we know what's going to happen. We have, you know, like 25 aircraft carriers and 10,000 planes, and they're going down. I mean, there's just no way they can possibly win against an economic powerhouse like the United States. It's over. So it doesn't really matter, you know, this little battle, that little battle. Maybe a few thousand extra people die or don't die because of this little thing here. But you know, anyway, that's my point. Yeah, so so it's funny. I mean, when you're writing a book like this, one of the things you do is you you, you seek out smart people and you tell them your ideas and then you see how they disagree with them. And <laughs> I was talking to a historian uh, early on in writing this where I told him the story I told you about uh, that, you know, that opens the book about um, the, the vacation to Kyoto in 1926 and, you know, how Henry Stimson then intervenes to, to bomb uh, Hiroshima instead of Kyoto because of this vacation. And his point immediately is like, yeah, but but like the war would have ended anyway, right? Like if it had been Kyoto, like we still would have had the end of World War II very likely, or maybe still Nagasaki or whatever. And I realized in that moment that I was like thinking about this totally differently because I was like, yeah, but if 100,000 different Japanese people were alive in 1945 from a different 100,000, I think the world would be different, right? Like, like I think if Kyoto was not there instead of Hiroshima, I think the world would be different. You know, lo loads of people go to Kyoto. I'm sure some listeners have been to Kyoto and been, you know, mesmerized by it. And so it's a question of like, are you thinking exclusively about a binary outcome or about the way of sort of causality in the grand stretch of things? And, you know, th this is the kind of, I also, you know, bring up one specific example where a person who made a major impact on the thinking around contingency and convergence, Motu Kimura, who is the evolutionary biologist uh, most associated with sort of uh, random sort drift. of neutral, neutral mutations was in Kyoto in 1945 and might have been blown up by the atomic bomb had it been dropped. So you, you have this world where it's like the field of evolutionary biology is swayed by a 1926 vacation that two people who at the time were not powerful figures in the United States government took. And then 19 years later, it leads to one city being blown up and another city being spared. Yeah, I, t I completely agree with you. At that point, the war was over. I mean, the U.S. was going to win. The U.S. and the allies were going to win. But like, I still think this would have shaped history in a radically different way if we fast forward to 2023 or 2024. So, you know, it's the kind of thing where um, it, the, the arguments that we have around historical contingencies, to me, I think are, are a bit myopic because they're sort of trying to force us into this question of like a categorization, which is a false view of whether this was important. Whether it was important for the war outcome, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Whether it was important for the diversion of history, I, th that I think yeah, everything is important. Yeah, I see. I see your point. Yeah. You know the, do you know the story of uh, Tsutamo Yamaguchi? Uh, so he lived in Nagasaki. He was on a business trip to Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. Boom, he survives. And he says, well, I'm getting out of here. I'm going back to home to Nagasaki. Boom. You know, so this is a great story, and he and, and he and he later wrote, "The only people who should be allowed to govern countries with nuclear weapons are mothers; those who are still breastfeeding their babies." <laughs> I like I'm, that. I'm, I'm laughing at this, uh, Michael, because the, <laughs> the the book the the book got a twenty thousand word haircut because my editor uh, oh, you said had that it was story. too long. Yeah, and I had I had that in the introduction oh. actually. The story of well, it was the I just world's... looked this up yesterday. Tell me if this is true because I always thought he's the only one, but it turns out there's a whole club of people that were at both cities. Yeah, I, the, he, he's the most prominent one, so I I, I don't know uh, the details of the others. I mean, the thing that's extraordinary about him is he lived a really long time. I think he died at like age ninety or something like that, yeah, after yeah. Sort of surviving yeah. two atomic blasts. <laughs> right. Uh, and and one of the questions that I think is interesting, by the way, about him is is he the world's unluckiest? or luckiest man. <laughs>
Yes, that's right. a very, very. Those are two very different ways of thinking about the world, depending on how you answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really funny. It's a great story. Okay, so let's talk about free will. Um, could you have done otherwise? Let's think about this for a second. Sort of rewinding your own tape. So this is how determinists often put. You know, could, it, it. Well, if the again, if the ta- if it's a tape of your life, no, you could not have done otherwise. If like you you describe, every single atom is the same. Yes, of course, you're you're going to do exactly what you did. But that's not the universe we live in. Um, although yesterday I had on uh, Paul Halpern, who's a uh, cosmologist and quantum physicist, and we were talking about his new book is on multiverses. So it depends on which version of the multiverse you're into, uh, where maybe these things could happen over and over and, and, and so forth with these quantum uh, bifurcations and whatnot. But it, it depends on your model of the universe. If the universe is predetermined, there's this block universe where everything has already happened and you dive into it at one slice of the bread, if it's a loaf of bread universe, that kind of thing. Well, then, no, you're the, you are what you did is fixed. You could not have done otherwise. But he says there, most physicists don't think, don't think the universe is predetermined, uh, but that it's, it's unfolding as we go, and we're part of the timeline. Okay, so you, I'll just make my argument for compatibilism, and you can <laughs> tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, and that is to say, you can learn from what happened, the universe is unfolding step by step, and you're part of the causal net. Yes, the universe is determined. We're part of the determined causal net. But we're also self-determining what happens next. And so no configuration of the next moment in the universe is ever going to be exactly like what happened. So I'm at some situation where it's similar to what happened before. And boy, last time I did this this thing X, and boy, that didn't turn out well. So I'm going to do something different uh, in this very similar but not exact situation, because I can learn from the past, so I can self-determine my future within barriers, of course, genetics and environment or whatever restrictions. Um, but I still have a role in playing that. So the universe is determined, but I'm helping to self-determine it based on knowledge of what already happened in the past. The universe is not predetermined, so you can do otherwise. That's my argument. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, I think you have to think about what are the sources of changing the trajectory of events, right? I mean, and also, what do you mean by self-determined? I don't think that I have a causal agent that is independent from the yes. physical makeup of my body. I'm an, I'm an naturalist, right? So I, I basically believe that I will, if I had the exact same organization of atoms as I do now, and I face the same stimulus, I will behave the same way. Now, learning is, is totally different because the learning changes my atoms, right? Like my brain structure is affected. That's how, you know, memory and learning operate is they're actually encoding in your brain a new piece of knowledge that, that means you're no longer the same, right? So the, the, the sort of libertarian point of view that, that I think is where you can sway events and change the trajectory believes that there's basically, in my view, some sort of like homunculus in your brain that's like separately for, separate from the physical matter. And people who believe in, in souls and so on, they, they have the same view. And, yeah. you know, I, I can't defeat that argument because it, it basically is derived from faith and faith is not defeated by rational arguments. So um, th- this is the kind of stuff where the, that's one group and I don't agree with it. I, there's lots of people who hold that with the soul or the sort of in, independent agent. And that's what I think most people mean when they say free will. They mean like, I can independently choose what to do yeah, separately right. from the physical matter in my brain. Then the second group, uh, which is where a lot of, I think, physicists come in, is with things like quantum effects. And they say the world is indeterministic because it seems that there is true randomness at the atomic and subatomic level. Now, I am not a physicist. I, you know, I, I can't say whether this is true or false in the sense that there are lots of different interpretations of the experimental data from quantum mechanics. Some of them are deterministic, right? Bohmian mechanics, super determinism, many worlds is a very weird mind-bending mm-hmm. form of determinism, because as you say, it depends what world you're in, uh, and so on. But that's a source of, of change that is not something that allows us free will. It's something where randomness is diverting trajectories. So I, I don't accept that as a form of free will. What I basically think of is, you know, when I make decisions, I'm a, I'm a causal agent, right? Like, there's no question about this. I think people who are misunderstanding me will think, oh, you know, you think we have no agency. No, I, I'm totally a causal agent. I'm doing things that are changing the trajectory of the universe. The question is whether those were determined by what came before me. And so the way I sort of think about it is like what I do now is going to be determined by what my arrangement of my atoms was literally one trillionth upon a trillionth of a millisecond before now. And that was caused by that 
trillionth upon a trillionth of a millisecond and so on. So it's it's this sort of infinite regress back to the beginning where everything is caused by what came immediately before it and the arrangement of, of basically matter uh, in, in the universe at that time. So, you know, I mean, that's, I just don't see, I totally understand the compatibilist argument, right? Which is, to me, totally valid because it allows determinism to coexist with free will. I think it's just a definitional disagreement over whether yeah. that's free. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's that's yeah, what certainly I mean. There's no there's no ghost in the machine. There's no mini me up there. Yeah. And even if there was, then it'd have to be a mini mini me inside mini me. <laughs> and so <laughs> it just kicks the can down the road. Yeah. Uh, but again, there's you know, our brains are, you know, have multiple neural networks doing different things. So you're familiar with the research on free won't, you know, where you you, you run the Benjamin LeBay experiments, but then you give uh, subjects the option to change their mind at the last second. And when they do, there's another part higher order, not the motor cortex, but a different part of your cortex that's overriding the impulses bubbling up from be below that the experimenter can see happen before the subject even knows which button they're going to push or when they raise their arm or whatever the task is. And so, but it, but it's multiple neural networks, you know, all the way down. There's lots and lots and lots of little inter interacting things, some of which you're not aware of, but some of which you are, in which you go, okay, now the last time this happened, I did this, so this time I'm going to do something else. Now, that may be determined in the way you, you just described, but it, am I not changing the future of my life, it, and therefore I am making choices? They are. I have some level of volition to a certain extent, and therefore I should be held accountable for the most part, unless I have a brain tumor or I'm addicted or whatever it is, crime of passion or something like that. You know, the law, in other words, I think the law mostly gets it right, and except for our retributive justice system, which I think is not helpful. But, you know, that holding people accountable to the extent that they know what the law is, they know the difference between right and wrong, they're not mentally ill, they don't, they don't have a tumor or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this, is, this is an area where I, I you know, I, I think I am probably, I, I'm a huge outlier among social scientists, I think, on this, uh, and probably you in the are, aren't public of, as well. Aren't most of them determinists? Most social scientists? I, no, no, I don't think so. I think okay. almost all, I think determinism is one of the cruelest things you can say to somebody about their theory. It's deterministic. Oh, uh, oh really? It's actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's most, most social scientists are indeterminists. Um, and, and a lot of them, yeah, I mean, but, but what I was going to say is that, I mean, I don't see why we should think differently about a brain tumor than about my brain, because I had no control over either of them. Right. Like like to me, whether my brain tissue is, quote unquote, healthy, which means it's in the bell curve of what normal human biology is, or it has a cancerous tumor that's affecting my judgment. It's both tissue. Right. Like if I want to make my brain do different things, I can't because my brain is what's controlling it to me. Right. So like this, the, the way I try to describe this in the book is I, I talk about how when I was eight years old, I saw this film Gettysburg. Now, of course, the world could have unfolded totally differently. My parents might not have shown it to me. We might not have gone on a road trip to the battlefield, which is why they showed it to me. All these things could have been different in the sort of, you know, thought experiment realm. But for whatever reason, when I saw that film, I was like totally hooked and I became weirdly obsessed with the Civil War for like four years, right? Like read loads of books about it, wanted to become a Civil War reenactor. I mean, it was, it was weird. But like, I didn't, I don't know why I did that. Like, you know, it's it, what it is, is it's a complex mix of upbringing, genes, experience, all those things. But they were all encoded in the brain structure I had and my physical body. And to me, I didn't independently decide what I would really like to be as an eight-year-old as a Civil War enthusiast, right? So the, the question from my perspective is not that we don't have causal power, not that we can't make decisions or choices. Of course we can. It's what's the underlying causal mechanism that's producing those. And because I believe in, in naturalism and the sort of physical basis of, of, of things, my viewpoint is that if you had the identical, literally myself arranged identically, and I don't mean close to identically, I mean the exact same atoms, the exact same universe, et cetera, watching that film as an eight-year-old, I would have the same reaction yeah, every sure. time. Yeah. And, and if I didn't, it would be because something had changed in my brain. That's, that's my viewpoint. Yeah. Well, I just had Dan Dennett on the show, and we, we t talked about this, and he, he said his answer to this is there's a difference between a tumor and healthy brain tissue to what extent you have some control over your actions or not the addict, the brain tumor uh, patient or whatever, they just have less control. So he, you know, he has this idea of degrees of freedom and some people have more degrees of freedom. Some have less and we have to take that into account, but most people, most of the time 
are making choices that we should hold them accountable for that. And that's a difference between, again, the, 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 the tumored patient, something like that. Anyway, to me, it seems like a lot of it depends on what you mean by these words. Sure. Again, back to, you know, Rumsfeld and, and you know, what, what do you mean by uh, free and determined? What do those words mean? It's a little bit like the hard problem of consciousness. You know, what do you mean by what it's like to be me or what it's like to be a bat or anything? You know, well, I, at some point, I don't really know what you're talking about. I can't, my little homunculus, there is no homunculus, can't tiptoe over to your skull to see if the red looks like my red on the Cartesian theater of your mind. This is a ridiculous idea. I can't know. You know, and if I if I tried to mimic a, a dolphin out here in the ocean and put on flippers and some sonar system or something, like, I w- at some point I would just be a dolphin. I wouldn't be wondering what it's, oh, now I know what it's like to be a dolphin. I would just be a dolphin or a bat or whatever. And so I, to me, it's one of these unknowable and solvable problems. It's maybe the way to say it is it's conceptually problematic or flawed the way it's presented. You can't know what it's like to be somebody else. You just can't. It's not possible. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think this is where you're, you're totally right about the definitional debates. I mean, I think, you know, what I, I, I listened to a debate between Sam Harris and Dan Dennett at one point. And, and, and the more I listened to it, the more I was like, I think they're just talking about different things. Um, but I also, you know, Sam Harris has this line and he's, he's a figure who's, you know, controversial and has viewpoints I don't agree with on lots of subjects. But, um, when it came to free will, he has a line that, uh, I like, which is he says, you know, the, the, the way that hard determinists look at compatibilists is that uh, a puppet is free so long as he likes his strings, right? This sort of idea that, and, and I think what, what he's saying is, it's a question of whether there is a, a sort of original cause or not, you know, it, and, and to some extent, there are implications for this. I mean, the criminal justice system, which I agree with you about the uh, retribution being being appalling. I mean, he has a line as well that deals with this, which I, I find persuasive, where he says, you know, we'd, we, we, we may not be able to control hurricanes. We'd still lock them up if we could. Right. And at some point, you can say that there is still a role for criminal justice, even in a world that is deterministic. Because you need to, you need to basically limit harm, um, and that requires sometimes putting people in prison. So you'd still have punishment. I mean, the question the question is, what would it be for? And there are interesting philosophical ideas that flow from that, right? About like sort of questions around how would you design a punishment system if you believe that people did not have free will, um, and depending on which definition you used. But you know, I I, I think those debates are are different from from what I'm talking about in Fluke, which is mostly around this question of what is the cause of why things happen? And to my mind, there is basically uh, t- two views that I find persuasive. One is the hard deterministic view, which is basically a series of reactions in the physical world from the Big Bang to the present. And the second is the quantum view, which is indeterministic because of quantum effects, where we don't understand it, but the world is being diverted by randomness. Neither of those really, to me, gives me the sense that I have independent free will in the sense of being an agent divorced from my physical matter. And that's where I think the definitions come in, right? Where, where, you know, I I don't really object that much to compatibilism because I think that they're basically just talking about free will in a different way from what I'm describing. Whereas Mm -hmm. I tend to think of free will as I literally could choose to do something different even with the exact arrangement of atoms in my body that I currently have. And I don't believe that. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's but the question. I don't, but this is, yeah, I don't either. And I'm familiar with Sam's arguments, of course. And I had, uh, er, er, earlier I had Greg Caruso who makes the mm. exact same arguments as Sam. He's a hard, hard determinist. And damn it. So they went back and forth. And again, after like two hours of my, you know, I'm just, my eyes are blurring over. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, these, you know, so many words, <laughs> you know, can we go out and look outside to see w- what's actually happening? All right. You know, and so Sam's argument, you could not have done otherwise, you know, his, exp- his uh, thought experiment of, you know, if he was that, that, whoever that's that, that serial killer was that broke into somebody's home and raped and murdered the whole family. And so if, if Sam's Adams were his, ad- yes, of course he would do the exact same thing, but this all turns on is the universe predetermined? Uh, it, the entire thing is already laid out, and I don't think it is. Now, I may be wrong about that because there's debate ap- apparently amongst physicists about that, as I mentioned. Uh, but uh, it, again, I think it depends on that. So I don't know. To me, there's, this, you know, this there's. Is, this, but this is, this is precisely why, you know, skepticism and so on is so valuable because, like, I obviously don't know either, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff where 
we've hit the limits of our understanding. Yeah. The debates yeah. are still really useful, right? Like I think the debates are important to have. And I also think that like thinking more about these problems, one of the things that I realized, and this is, you know, just sort of a personal aside from writing the book, but like I honestly did not think about this this much, that much before three years ago. I mm. when I was started thinking about the early stages of this book and I started doing some research, and like it's affected my worldview, right? And it's not it's not because I have the right answer. It's because like, you know, inquiring about these questions actually makes you examine your life differently. And the thing that I find sort of sad about the the, the world around us is that there are a lot of people who just never contemplated these questions. Um, and I think they would live their lives differently if they did. They come up with their own answer, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think the world is big enough for all of us to answer the question around free will, what it means and what it means for your own life differently. And I, I, I hope I'm respectful in how I write about it and talk about it. Oh, you are totally. No, it's 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 a great book. I do think. Uh, no, I, I accept your argument uh, now. I think now that I think about it, because I've been asking maybe the wrong question. What's going to happen? I don't know if I'm at a bifurcation point, a, a point of criticality where the little uh, one grain of sand, I walk out the door and I go left instead of right, and that ends up making a difference. It could be, probably not. Uh, you know, my my the, like, apply the Copernican principle to myself. I'm not special. Probably most of what I do is not that special. So it probably doesn't make a big difference, but you never know, right? And even in your personal life. So if it, everybody has a story about how they met their spouse, right? So, but at this point, uh, uh, you know, I'm happily married. I'm, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter if I go left or right, or I bump into somebody, uh, some woman at the supermarket, it, nothing's going to happen because I'm not, lo- I'm not at a point in my life where I'm single looking for somebody and, oh, I just happened to go to this party and there she is. And, you know, th- that, that kind of story. Or a job, you know. I ended up being a cyclist um, because I graduated with a master's degree in experimental psychology from Cal State Fullerton in 1978, and I just wanted to be a college, a community college professor because it seemed like a great job. You know, you just get paid to give lectures and you get summers off. It just seemed like this is the this is the career, <laughs> an academic. That's what I want to do. And but there were no jobs. I mean, uh, it, it was just a grim job market. So I went and I had to get a job. So I went over to the placement office and they said, well, what, what are your skills? I go, I have no skills. I'm a college student, but I like to write. I really want to be a writer. So we just looked in the book and there was a job at a bicycle magazine, bicycle dealer showcase as a trade magazine for the bike industry. And they needed an editor. So I went and, you know, on the first day on the job, I interviewed this guy, John Marino, who had just ridden across America from L.A. to New York, broke the Guinness Book of Records, did it in 12 days, three hours, 41 minutes. And he, it turns out he lives like three miles from where I live like, Oh my God, I want to meet this guy. So I bought a bike and I, I went rode with John. I entered the, this Yo Play Yoga 50 kilometer race in Griffith Park. And all. And so, and, and so the next 10 years, I'm just bike racing. So that was, a, it, had I gotten a job teaching Psych 101 at some community college, none of that would have happened, right? But at this point in my life, I'm 69, I'm publishing a magazine, I'm doing what I'm doing. Nothing like that can happen for my, tweak my career down one path or another. But I guess your point would be, in the next 10 years, who knows what could happen that could lead to something. Maybe I get hired by the government to do something, you know, some job, who knows? I just don't know. So there, I guess your point would be everything you do now still could matter, if not to your own life, to somebody else's life. So act as if what you're, every bifurcation, every moment is a bifurcation point that could make a difference. Yeah. For, first off, by the way, I, I, when we last spoke, I didn't know this about the, the race across America. It's such a legendary thing. It's amazing. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but the, the, the thing I was going to say about this is, you know, I, I think that every moment we have affects the future trajectory of who, who is alive and who's not alive in the future. Right. And I think that's the most important thing. So what I mean by that is, you know, you have stuff where when you start to think about this more seriously, I, you know, get introduced to you. We do a podcast. I end up back on the podcast. Different people listen to it. They read the book. It affects their life and their thinking slightly, right? Uh, or they listen to other podcasts and that podcast, you know, they listen to a different episode because I, you know, I send them to listen to this one. Then they listen to your back catalog and then they mention it at the pub. And that hits off a conversation with a person who becomes a friend. I mean, this kind of time of stuff is happening constantly, right? Whereas, you know, I, I honestly, I mean, the, the way that I think about the world is like every single time that you think about how a person is created, it's a, any difference in that day 
would create a different person, right? Any change. Because, you know, without going into graphic mm-hmm. detail here, the exact moment in which a sperm fertilizes an egg, even microseconds create a different person. Mm-hmm. But if you start to think that way, then literally every interaction that happens, I mean, you, you talk about convergence. Okay, the same people meet. Let's imagine that you're going to end up with the same spouse because, I don't know, you're going to bump into them a different way if you didn't bump into them this way. Okay, but if it's five days later, you might have a different kid, right? And so, like, you know, these are the kinds of things where I think we just have this view of ourselves and our lives that, that just writes this out as noise. I, I, I mean, I have a personal pet peeve with this idea of the single signal and the noise precisely because I don't think there is noise. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's sort of the argument of fluke in a nutshell is like there is no noise. Everything is important because contingency means that at any moment you can amplify tiny, seemingly insignificant details that blow up at some point way down the road, Right. Might be immediate, might be have a, a major shock like the pandemic did, or maybe there's some microbe out there that's evolving right now that's going to create, you know, and 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 someone is is disinfecting a surface and has just averted the last pan, the next pandemic and we don't know, and those are sort of what I call the hidden ripples uh, of life where things are constantly changing and you'll never know how the world would be different because you simply can't rerun Earth. So, <laughs> uh, we, we've, practically speaking, we can't do anything about this, but I do think it's fascinating to think about. Oh, totally. Um, I mean, the, the role of luck and how lives turn out is much larger than most people think. And your book is made the strongest argument I've, I've seen in that regard. Um, you know, just think, I was thinking of examples like had Bill Gates been born 10 years earlier or 10 years later, you know, he would not be Bill Gates. He'd, be, he'd probably be successful because he's a smart, hardworking guy. Uh, or the, you know, the Google guys came along right at the moment when search engines were needed and they were on the verge of erupting so there you get some some necessity though right because you know the you know the when the software was needed for the hardware that came online it was like right down to the week or month that gates happened to be there at the right time at the right place with his software you know it almost came down to like that day he happened to go to that wherever that ibm or wherever it is and had that meeting and it's like that's their, that's the software could have gone otherwise and so, and so that's your point, right? So much of life is like that. We miss most of the, that luck. Yeah, I mean, like the way I would think about it in that example would be that somebody was going to create a personal computing giant, you know, in the 1980s. And maybe it was going to be, you know, Steve Jobs, or maybe it was going to be Bill Gates, or maybe it was going to be somebody else. But I think who it was was important. I, I, I think that's yeah. the point, right? If, if somebody, somebody would have been like Google probably, but if it was a different company, the world would be different. And I think there's all this sorts of stuff where we just sort of say, oh, no, like a search engine company would have emerged. OK, but would have it also have put the same emphasis on maps and, you know, aggregations of all sorts of other businesses and so on. And, you know, that's the, the exact people would have made the company different. You know, if you had Apple, but Steve Jobs got killed, uh, I think it would have been a different company and then a different world. So there is obviously convergence. There are moments in which it's ripe, which is why you have things like, you know, parallel inventions or whatever it's called, simultaneous inventions, where things just get invented around the same time repeatedly. But I think individual personalities that are involved with them can shape the trajectory of how that technology um, proceeds in very important ways. And so, you know, and, you know, if, if Steve Jobs had gotten hit by a car when he was five and was disabled, I think the world would be different. I mean, there's all these things where I just... the. You know, I, I know that this sounds like quite a radical view, but I genuinely think that the world would be substantially different if Steve Jobs had been born one day earlier mm-hmm. because he would have met different people and the mater- you know, his parents might have had different friends in the maternity ward. Maybe he would have gotten infected with a disease. I mean, there are just in- infinite contingencies in life. And uh, <laughs> it's mind boggling, but I, I think it's true. I mean, I, th- I think this is genuinely true about uh, the way the world operates. and. Um, Plenty of people disagree with me. I mean, Simon, Simon Conway Morris would, would vehemently disagree with everything that I've said about evolutionary biology, as you said. Um, so there's lots of room for debate here. But I, I have a pretty pretty strong view that contingency shifts trajectories. Uh, some of them are more important. As you say, like, you know, power amplifies contingency. So like what the president of the United States does or whether they had a good night's sleep is way more important in the short run than whether I had a good night's sleep. But whether I had a good night's sleep is still going to change the world in some way. I don't know how. Maybe I get into a car accident. Maybe nothing happens for a few days, but then something happens. You know, we don't know. But so so there are things that amplify contingency. And some of the work that I'm starting on now in my sort of academic uh, work is, is uh, 
trying to identify those features that make contingency more or less important. And I know you've written a lot about this in the past, so uh, expect an email after our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. I just uh, recorded a podcast episode with Jared Diamond uh, at our conference here in person. So his next uh, big book is on leadership. Right? And Jared's a really careful researcher. I mean, he spends years and years just collecting as much information as he can. So I asked him, and so he's like three years into this project, you know, le leaders in politics and science, art, medicine, anything, just everything. And, you know, what makes a great leader? So then we were talking about the Steve Jobs example, because I use that, uh, I call that the biography bias, you know, after Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs came out, everybody read it. Okay, what's the secret sauce here? You know, oh, you got to go to an elite liberal arts college like Reed College, then drop out, move back to your parents' house, start a startup with your buddy in the garage, and that's the, and then act like an asshole to your employees, but be super creative. Anyway, whatever. And it's like, well, how many people write biographies of all the people that did exactly that and they went out of business, right? And it, you know, most of them n n never succeed. So you know, in height, we have the hindsight bias there. But anyway, so then uh, I said, well, okay, of all these people you've studied so far, you know, just centuries of great leaders, what's, you know, what's, what are the half dozen characteristics? And he said, I, you'll have to ask me in a couple more years. I have not found it. And his point was that a great leader, there is, there's not six things or whatever. It's that person at that time did the right thing or whatever they did. And this is your point about contingency. There's no model like, okay, these are the six things and you can be the next Steve Jobs. No one can be the next Steve Jobs. But it's not, yeah, no, I agree with that completely. Um, but I think that it's also something where when we evaluate a great leader, we're ignoring the contingencies that could have made him a terrible leader, right? Uh -huh. So like a lot of people think about, you know, JFK as a good leader or, uh, you know, a lot of people who are Republican in the US, you know, revere Ronald Reagan. I mean, you look at things like the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that could have gone very differently. Would we have said that JFK was a great leader if everybody got blown up? Would we have said that everyone is a great leader under Ronald Reagan if there was a few near misses with nuclear disaster that we didn't even know about in the Soviet Union at the time, right? There was, there's, there's classic examples of this where people in contingent moments make decisions that avoid, you know, basically nuclear war. And, and I think that's the kind of stuff where what happens is you have a data set of like leaders and you're saying like, oh, because things turned out well, Therefore, they were a good leader. I mean, it's the same stuff as like what I, I wrote about this incorruptible a little bit, but it's like, it's like the challenger problem where like the challenger blew up after several launches that had the same red flags, but nobody audits success, right? They audit failure. So like the, the person who was in charge of NASA was a great leader until the challenger blew up and then it happened. Sometimes presidents are in charge of a period where they just avert disaster because they got lucky or some random thing averted a calamity. And then we say, oh, they made a good leader. What should we do? And we mimic them. And so, you know, this is where it's also important when you think about contingency to not misunderstand, you know, sort of assessing the characteristics that make good outcomes. Because if the outcomes could have turned out differently with a small tweak, then maybe the leader wasn't so brilliant after all, they just got lucky. And I think that happens quite a lot. I mean, people also inherit situations that are more likely to be stable than others. I mean, you know, coming into office during the pandemic is not an easy hand to be dealt. So, I, you know, there's there's stuff like this where the the sort of secret sauce, you know, you get all these people, well, like, let's find the secret sauce of great leadership. And I just, you know, there's like l layers upon layers of misunderstanding how I think the social world works that have to go into that. I mean, there are, th there are characteristics we can tease out that can say like design systems to, to make it more likely that someone behaves well in power. And that's what a lot of my, my previous research worked on. Um, the idea that if you just have these five characteristics, you're going to be a great leader, I think is just BS, basically. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good place to end, Brian. Here's the book again, Fluke, K Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. Uh, it, it, it does feel good to, to think that I could make a difference. I probably don't, but maybe the nice little thing I do changes somebody's life, and who knows? You just don't know. So that's a good, uh, that's a good uplifting final message I think you, you deliver. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's been such a great conversation. I love it. All right. I'll